Okay, well, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Soledad Fernandez. I am um, uh, faculty in biomedical informatics, the Department of Biomedical Informatics, and also the director of Center for Biostatistics. And I have been, I've been at Ohio State for many years. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about experimental design today, and then Joe will uh, do the hands-on part where we have examples and, and applications of uh, the things that uh, concepts that I want uh, to emphasize in this talk. So um, when we start an experiment, either um, it's a, a sequencing experiment or, or, or any type of research experiment, um, we need to think about the design. And um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is what you, what you think that experimental design is and it's important for and, and why is it that, that we need to have a design on, on, or well-designed experiments. So um, the, the design is just the plan for assigning experimental units to treatments or conditions. And, and there are three main reasons why we want um, to have well design experiments. Uh, the purpose of any uh, experiment is, is to try to answer research questions. So the, the three main uh, reasons that we need to have design is uh, to be able to have something to say or, or to have a, an explanation of uh, about the relationship between the independent and dependent variables. So ca causation or causation reason we need to control um, for uh, confounding or, or effects that are extraneous to what the, the main things, uh, variables that we want to involve in the experiment. So anything that is outside and will change the, the direction or the, will be exogenous to what we want to uh, study uh, has to be controlled. And um, we want to some, have some sort of measure of the variability, right? Um, and, and a notion of what is the variability in, in, our, in what we are measuring or the conditions that we're measuring. So uh, while design experiment, we need to try to reduce that variability as much as possible to just focus on uh, the scientific question. The design elements or things that go into design or what we need to think about are uh, variables, right? And we have different type of variables, what variables are observable, variables that we can control. We also talk about dependent and independent variables. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those. Measurements, um, type of variables in terms of how we make those, you know, how what data we get, right? Are it's gonna be is data is continuous data, binary, categorical, ordinal, you, you know all these things. Other important element in design is grouping, how we're gonna make the groups. Typically we want to compare groups. So uh, there are special type of uh, I, uh, designs that de depending on what is what we are going to study or compare. And then we need to think about how we're going to analyze the data or, you know, what, are, what is going to be the, what analysis we're going to, or plan for the analysis. Um, why is design uh, important? I already said is because we want to uh, be able to address a research question. We want to use uh, proper methods to address a research question. We would like to have uh, experiments that have appropriate sample size. And we, most important, we want to be able to uh, interpret our results and make inferences about our uh, results. So if we don't have uh, well-designed experiments, you know, we are not probably going to arrive to strong conclusions. Type of uh, study design are different types. You know, we have observational studies, could be um, experimental, prospective, retrospective, longitudinal, cross-sectional. I'm pretty sure everybody, you know, has a notion of what these concepts mean. The structure of the data. Um, 
it's, in the, it's, it's important, right? Uh, we are going to uh, have groups that, uh, in our study that are independent, say two, two groups, treatment and control, but they are completely independent. Are we going to compare more than two groups, right? Treatment and control, or are we going to have a treatment A, treatment B, and a control? Are we going to have correlated measures, right? Pair samples, before and after, or pair by other reasons, you know, mice in the same litter. Um, or um, are we going to have, uh, you know, like one leg left or right? So those are sort of all correlated measures that we need to, uh, to, to take into account when we do the analysis. There are deep, different types of of uh, correlated measures or repeated measures, right? We do it at several time points. We measure the same thing several different time points. Uh, the within group correlation, I was talking about the litter within the litter or within familiar correlations. Those are things that we need uh, to think about and, and we need to plan how we're gonna do the analysis. Uh, investigators, um, I, I, we get all these um, investigators that they always think, they say, well, you were doing the left and right side of the animal, but we consider those independent. Well, no, it's the same animal, so they cannot be independent measures when they are you know, on the same animal. And you understand that, right? You're not gonna argue with me that left and right or right and left are two independent measures. They cannot be. These are, they are the same animal, the genetics, the, the makeup of the animal, of course it's gonna be you know, completely different when you have two different measures from two different animals. So those are structural co or, uh, correlations that we need to take into account. In uh, continuous design variables, you know, are we talking about correlations among variables or between variables. There are three uh, basic uh, or fundamentals of uh, experimental design that um, you want or the, the super important concepts that uh, when you start thinking about an experiment, you need to think about. The first one is uh, we need to have every experiment is good to have replication. Replication is basically repetition of the basic uh, experiment, reduces effect of uncontrolled variation, so increases precision when you have more than one measurement. And it's the, if we have replicates, we can quantify uncertainty or variability. The other important concept is randomization, and why is randomization important? Because uh, we avoid, avoid biases, or bias and controls for the role of uh, just things occurring by chance. And the third concept is blocking. Um, we need to think about how, you know, experiments that we sometimes we want to block or make things in block units more homogeneous. It's a technique used to increase the precision of an experiment. We reduce the uh, confounding effects by uh, blocking experimental units or putting experimental units into blocks. Make experimental units, makes experimental units more homogeneous, as I said. Uh, the variability within a block will be less compared to the variability between blocks. We can compare different conditions treatment and control within blocks. So you can have a block that has the two treatment conditions and you could make the comparison within a block. Takes into account the differences between blocks. Also, we can compare differences uh, between the two different blocks and the sizes of groups or blocks should be as balanced as possible to make all those things possible. So let's go through an example. Let's say that, a very simple question. Um, we have, the recent question is that uh, salted drinking uh, water affect blood pressure in mice. So our experiment, the first that I thought of doing is, well, I'll get a mouse and we provide water 
uh, with 1% of salt or whatever that chlorine of sodium is, we give the, the mice this salty water for 14 days and we measure blood pressure. Is this a good experiment? No. Why? We don't have a control. We don't have measure blood pressure when, every day, at the end of the experiment. This is really, there are no details here, not good. Control, of course, we need to compare with something, right? Good experiments are comparative. We compare blood pressure in mice, so we say we are going to compare blood pressure in mice filled with uh, salt water to blood pressure in mice that have plain water. Or compare blood pressure in strain, e, strain A with the mice that, have felt, uh, that, were, that had, were given salty water to strain B fed with salt water. So this is all you know about. So, but the, diff, the, the question that you answer with each experiment is different, right? So we're talking about how we design experiments. It depends on what question we need to answer. You see that those two bullets give, uh, give, uh, will answer different questions. Ideally, the experimental group has to be uh, concurrent. We need to have a, a, control, a concurrent control. Historical controls are not a good solution. Why is that? Because experiments that, you know, you cannot compare to an experiment that was done in the past. The conditions were different. We cannot control how the other experiment was run. It's, you know, all the things that we talk about, we don't have control of for how the, the historical data was obtained. Replication. I think that this figure is self-explanatory, uh, and nobody is going to argue that it's probably better to have more than one measurement versus compare one to one, right? We need replicates. We need uh, to, to repeat or measure the experiment, to do the experiment uh, more than once or more than animal. Then the question is what replicates are, but that is another question we're going to talk. So why do we need to replicate? Because it reduces the effect of uncontrolled variation, increase uh, precision, we can quantify uncertainty. In, and uh, every time we run an experiment, when you are measuring blood pressure, for example, you want to have a sense of variability, right? Blood pressure in all these mice are going to be different, but it will be good to have an estimate, a confidence interval, or an, a measure of uncertainty, or uncertainty around that estimate. We can only get that if we have more than one uh, experimental unit. So the question is, OK, so we are good. We know that we need replicates. We need to, re to have that sense of variability. Uh, we need to be able to measure that. But, and, and this applies for you know, uh, uh, lab experiments or cell lines. What are actual replicates? What is, and, and we start talking about biological versus technical replicates. And then what is tied to that question is, what is the N or the sample size for cell culture experiments? When cell lines are derived from different individuals, each sample is a biological replicate, and samples are independent of each other. But when cell lines are manipulated in a lab, those are no, bio, there are no biological replicates. They only, these are only technical replicates. Right? And it's important to have this replication at the right level in order to have valid inferences. But again, the biological replicate or the technical replicate will measure different things, variability in different things. When biological variation dominates the technical variation, measuring more samples is better than replicating measurements right, of the samples. So getting the same sample, a cell line from one individual and replicate that. But if there are a lot of the, the, the variation among individuals, different samples is large, we need more biological replicates. So one cannot substitute the other, cannot be say, oh, well, I don't have enough samples. We're going to do a lot of technical replicates. We're going to be fine. 
No, it's not. They're going to give measuring different, different things, different variabilities around different things. So let's go to what is the, the sample size in each of these situations, right? Say that we get one single vial, right? And we divide it into two cultures, and then we do three samples that are piped or piped it in each in each dish, right? Versus this case that we have the same sample, but we divide it into um, six cultures, right? And then from each of the cultures, we get a measurement. You see the differences, right? Is this a sample size six in both cases? Well, here we just one, and, and it's just split in two, and then, you know, we get basically the three technical replicates out of, out of one versus the other one, unless you know we are having one from it. Uh, is this the uh, better situation when we have the same, uh, the same sample, but now we do it across you know, three different days, right? So the main difference is that the whole procedure is repeated three times, right? Even though the same starting material, we have the same cell line is used, right? We have variability at least of doing the experiments more than once. But this is technical. We are still measuring technical variability. These are independent now. So we can say that uh, we have three replicates or three different measures, three different days. The two dishes from the same day should be pair, right? We should, these are pair comparison, pair observations. So we're clear on what a technical replicate or a biological replicate is. Another uh, the, uh, concept that we said that it's important when we design is randomization. And then again, I wonder, and, and, and sometimes I don't even want to ask a question because I'm afraid of the answer when uh, I work with uh, bench scientists. Are you actually, do they actually use these techniques of randomization when they work with, you know, uh, cell cultures or, or, or mice? And some people are kind of laughing. Uh, are we actually randomizing? mice to different conditions. Um, and random does not mean just grab two mice from a cage haphazardly and, and assign those to controls or, or treatment. One needs to split the uh, uh, randomize units using a computer coin size or cars or the hat with numbers, but it's just not the first two that I grab. Right? Maybe the first two that I grab are because those were the slowest mice, mice in, the, in the cage. That is not a good procedure. Right? Um, again, I I'm feel guilty about not asking this question to investigators, uh, not being hard enough when, we, when they bring me data from you know, their lab experiments. And, and people are laughing, but this is important. This you know, jeopardizes the whole you know, statistical fundamentals is, and, and inferences. Right? So why is important randomization? Because we avoid bias. For example, the first six mice that you grab might have intrinsically higher blood pressure. Right? Uh, we, we, if we randomize we experimental uh, units to, to treatments, we control the role of chance. Randomization allows the use of probability theory and all the statistical fundamentals and are based on, on this probability uh, theory. Another uh, concept for, uh, or, or important uh, principle in experimental design is uh, stratification. So suppose that they're going to be this, the same example that blood pressure measurements will be made uh, in the morning and some in the afternoon. If you anticipate differences between morning and afternoon measurements, you need to think of how you're going to do it. Right? We need to ensure that within each period, there are equal numbers of subjects in each treatment and control group. You're not going to measure all the control animals in the morning and all the treatment animals in the afternoon, because then you have confounding, 
right? You cannot disentangle the differences between morning and afternoon versus the difference between control and treatment, right? So this is what we call, or we talk about blocking. We try to make blocks as homogeneous as possible by making sure that we can disentangle differences that are due to blocks versus differences that are due to treatment assignments. So say now that we, our uh, experiment, we now we make it larger because one mouse in each group is not going to be good enough. We, we already are past that. So we decided that we're going to have 20 male mice and 20 female mice. Half of these will be treated with salt water, and the other half left and treated or you know, given plain water. But we can only work with four mice a day. How to assign individuals to treatment groups in two days? So 40 mice total, four mice per day. If we only work Monday through Friday, we're going to need two weeks to run this experiment. How are we going to do it? Well, I already told you, this is about design, right? If you do week one, all control groups, and on top of that, the controls are all female, and week two, treatment group, and they are all male. Really bad design, terrible. Why? Why? Go ahead. Right, okay, right, yeah, all those is, all things confounded here. Okay, it's a problem, see, the, when we do this, that's exactly what happens. When week one, we have all female, and they're all control, and week two, we have all male, and they're all treatment, assigned to treatment, right? We cannot study gender and treatment as two different effects. Now, going back to what does it happen in, you know, in real life all the time, in sequencing experiments, when we have uh, treatments are always sequenced the same uh, lanes, it's impossible to separate the lane effect, right? So there might be systematic variation due to lane in, uh, in the, or base calling, and we are always assigning the same treatment to the same lane. We cannot separate them out. We have that confounding issue, right? So say that now we're going to do a little bit and we're going to be smarter. And then we decided to have, uh, you know, treatment and control. You know, two, two treatment and two control mice in each day, right? This is a little better. But let's look at the counts when we have for week one, right, and week two. So if we look at the control and treatment groups, week one we have eight and 12, and week two, we have 12 and eight, opposite for uh, control. And then, you know, the differences between, um, so, so this is a, a randomized design, but it's, it's, not, it's not balanced, right? You can, you can see that, that they are not, it's not perfectly balanced when you are compare you know, control week one, control week two, you're comparing basically eight to 12 uh, mice or the other, the opposite for uh, treatment if you want to separate that effect. Which is not, it's, it's doable, it's possible, there is nothing uh, terrible, terrible wrong, but a better stratified design will be this, the following. So now we have two controls to treatment per day but this design will give me balance counts as, you know, five female in control and treatment uh, groups and five male control and treatment group for week one and week two. This is a perfectly balanced uh, design. So it's randomized and balanced. 
So randomization and stratification, uh, when, when are we gonna use one or the other? We need to use both, it's not one and, or the other, but mostly what is what variables we're gonna randomize and stratifice. Stratify is if you can uh, fix a variable, right? Uh, mice are the same age or, or, st or strain, you, uh, you can you, you, you stratify, right? If you don't fix a variable, Sorry, if you fix a variable, um, I'm, I'm getting distracted here. If you don't fix a variable, you need to stratify for it, right? Use both eight week and 12 week old mice and stratify within, uh, with respect to age. If you can neither fix nor stratify a variable, randomize it. So um, the, the gender and, and weak effect, we, those were fixed variables that we can uh, stratify for it. It's something that is things that we cannot fix, say genetic makeup of uh, mice if there are different strains or things like that, we need to randomize uh, those. Sorry, I was just getting distracted. So this, the random is this uh, experiment with gender and, and, and treatment. It, leads to two factor experiments. Say we have factor A or factorial experiments that we're going into now. Factor A has A levels and factor B has B levels. Each replication of the experiment contains all A, B combinations. When factors are arranged in a factorial experiment, they are often said to be cross. And that's uh, what we just uh, saw with the, the two uh, factorial experiment we spoke about. Then we can differentiate what is the effect of the um, main factor is a change in the response produced by a change in the level of uh, that factor, right? Say um, the difference between male and female, right? The factor gender has two levels. The change in response will be their, their the, due to that gender effect. We might find the difference in response between the levels of one factor is not the same at the levels of the other factor, and then it's when we talk about interactions. So with the two factorial design that we were talking about, we can also study interaction effects. So suppose that we were interested in the effect of both salt water and diet on blood pressure now the factor water within two levels uh, has explained and salt water. The factor diet has two levels, normal and high fat. These two factorial experiments are more efficient than doing two single factor experiments. Say that we only measure the difference between uh, plain and salt water, and then we run another experiment to measure the difference between normal and high fat diet. So two separate experiments, uh, two factorial experiments sometimes are more efficient than making single factor experiments. But it, has, it doesn't mean that we can write a multifactorial experiment and put all the factors together and write the mega experiment, right? Then there is a trade-off between uh, the size of the experiment and interpretations, right? When having the mega experiment, typically does not work because interpretations are super hard and with very little we can uh, uh, make out of that, okay? Um, so what I was talking is in a two factorial experiment, we can study interactions and these two plots show what an interaction eff effect means. The difference between plain and salt water here is the same delta Obviously, high uh, fat diet is higher blood pressure in general, but the delta between plain and salt is this, it doesn't matter what diet they are on the mice. And um, versus the different one that, you know, the, the difference between in blood pressure between plain and salt water, normal diet is not as pronounced than when we, these mice are on, high, on a high fat diet. Right, so we say that that is an interaction uh, between the two factors. The multifactorial and the more than two factor design, that's what I said, the advantages of doing running a two factorial design is cost effective and we can investigate interactions. 
the disadvantages when we, more, when we have more than two factors is the higher order interactions are so difficult to interpret. And the sample size of the experiment is going to be much larger. So you need to be careful not to run mega experiments um, when you don't know what you want to make out of those uh, complicated interactions. Two additional design element, elements that, uh, that we need to, and, and uh, folks that work in the lab are, uh, need to be aware of, the bl uh, blinding, and actually it's not just for any experiment, right? Blinding, when, when uh, measurements are made by people that can be influenced by unconscious biases, right? If you are dissecting animals and then you know that, you know, these are the animals that should get tumors, maybe you're gonna be much more, you know, looking for that tumor when, uh, when you are dissecting, right? So you should be blinded to what group the, the animal was assigned to. Right? Internal controls. It can be useful to use the subjects themselves at their own controls. Again, that is kind of the before and after and, and pair um, uh, measurements. Why? Because this will increase the precision on what we are actually want to detect. So uh, design, of course, we saw at the beginning that they are linked and intertwined with a recent question we want to ask, right? Uh, depending how we design the, the experiment, remember giving salt water to, uh, you know, uh, different measuring between control and salty water differences is one thing, or just measuring differences between a strain A or B, both fed by salty water. Those are different questions. So they are interrelated. The, they're the important things or, or concepts to have in mind when we are thinking about what is a research question and what is the design that we're going to do for the experiment is what is our target population? What is the population of, of interest? What are we going to measure? Difference between strains, A and B, or just uh, we're going to make an inference about whether salty water increases blood pressure. What are we targeting? Is it in mice? Is it in humans? Is it in older mice? Is it in younger mice? What is the target? And then that's how we're going to dictate what, how we design the experiment. What is intervention being studied? We need to have a clear definition of that. What is the comparison group? We need to have a control. What is the outcome of interest? It's going to be survival. It's going to be blood pressure. Is it going to be, what is the end point? And over what time period is going to take uh, place? 14 days, it's a month, is it two days, is it, you know, um, you know we, need to, we need to have all those concepts clear. Another super um, um, important concept is what is a clinical versus a statistical uh, significant effect, right? Uh, typical um, investigators come to us and say, I need to run uh, an experiment, I need to see, and then I need to find significant differences. Okay? Uh, what is clinically relevant? Because we can get a sample size large enough that any minor difference will be statistically significant. But is that difference relevant? Is something worth studying, spending money, or investing our time on? And this uh, uh, example illustrates what I'm saying, right? Just because two treatments or experimental conditions produce mean responses that are different or statistically different, that doesn't mean that it's a practical or clinically relevant difference. And this was a paper published in Nature many years back where they designed, the, 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 the hypothesis was that, that people, men that are born in the spring are taller than men that born in the fall. And then they measure, uh, they have designed, they measure, you know, half a million of Australian soldiers, and they found that, yes, there is a difference between those born in the spring and the fall. But it's just a six, like less than a quarter of an inch difference in height. That was statistically different. But is that, super, is that relevant? No, it's not important, right? It's not. So, so is the definition of what is clinically relevant is something that 
we as scientists, we need to know and do our homework. What is what we want to detect and what was that what we want to uh, power a study for, to find what difference. So, okay, we, we designed our experiment, we collected our data, uh, we're gonna do statistics uh, or, or on it, right? And, and what is the statistics? What are we doing, right? Um, help us, you know, data exploration and analysis. We, uh, we can make inferences um, if um, we set those pro experiments properly, right? We, we talk about having two different hypotheses and all the alternative hypotheses, and uh, there are some type one and two errors. I'm pretty sure you all heard about these concepts, and I'm gonna try to go through the rest of the time I have and through all these um, concepts. So go back to the example that does salt water increase blood pressure. So basically what we want to say is that it, the mean difference between salt, uh, water, and plain and blood pressure is larger than zero, right? So we set the hypothesis and we work for, you know, on the contrary in statistics, the null hypothesis is, and we want to basically reject the null in favor of the alternative. Alternative is the one that we want to prove, right? That the mean is larger than zero. So our alternative will be say, well, maybe it's not, it's lesser or equal than zero, right? So how do we, we reject when we do the analysis and get our significant p-value, right? We claim that we reject the null in favor of the alternative, right? So how we do that, we collect data, and then we look. Is there enough evidence that the sample could not have come from a, po a population with mean, the difference mean less or equal than zero, right? The other thing that uh, we use statistics for is we quantify the quantification of uncertainty, and for that is we build confidence intervals around our estimates. So the type one, type two error dilemma. So we don't know the reality of what our hypothesis is true or not, but let's assume for this a minute that yes, we do, right? So the reality is that we have a true null hypothesis or is, is, is false, right? We have those two options. And this is what we measure, right? On the vertical axis, you know, what is our conclusion? Right? If we do not uh, reject our null hypothesis and the reality is that the null is true, we are fine. It's a correct decision, right? S similarly, if we do reject the null and the reality is that false, we are also, we have made a correct decision. But if we are in the off diagonal quadrant, we are making a type, a one error, you know? It's a, 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 a one type of error, sorry. It's the type one error is the one that is on the upper uh, right corner, and the type two error is when we say that the null hypothesis is false, but we do not reject. This can be translated in those, you know, um, uh, normal curves saying, saying that, you know, we are working under the continuous normal distribution and mu not and mu one are the, mu, the means under the no hypothesis or the alternative, right? These are, this is a continuous line that we have all the Gaussian curves, right? But we just illustrating this, right? So, if our sample and then the, the value, our mean value falls in that tail, the shade, the blue, right? We conclude that we reject our null hypothesis. But if you look, that shaded area falls under the null distribution. So that was a mistake. That was our error. We, ha we thought that it belonged to this other uh, curve but it's actually the tail of the distribution under the null. That is one error. 
if our sample falls in the red area and we say, oh, we have evidence to not reject the null, but look at the shaded, the shaded red is falls under the distribution of the alternative. That's an error. We were confused. We were tricked. But that is what our data, we don't know the reality, right? So if H null is true and we incorrectly reject the null, we made a mistake, which is type one error. If we knew the truth, which we don't, but say we know, we can cal calculate the probability of that type one error, and that's what we call alpha. <coughs> if the alternative is true and we incorrectly fail to reject H null, we must have the distribution of the alternative to calculate the probability of type two error, which we call beta. The good area for us, and what is the power of the experiment, is all the white, the, what is on the, the, what is it, right of the red area, which is the power of study, what is if the alternative is true and we correctly reject H null, right, that, is, that occurs with probability one minus beta, right? You all know that the, the, this is the sampling distribution, the area under the curve is one. Right? So one minus beta is the power of the study. What does power bias? Well, getting a published result, that's for sure. <laughs> if uh, power is high, and that's what, you know, I'm, I'm joking about it, right? Is, uh, and, and, and I argue that you know if you if you have a good power and result, negative results should be as publishable as the positive results. If power is high and test uh, is non-significant, this implies that the effect, if any, is very small. So non-significant studies will be informative, right? At least so people don't keep doing the same experiments again. You know, it might be informational too, right? Um, the studies with high power give researchers a greater chance uh, to identify an effect if exists. So we want, of course, uh, studies that, uh, and, and what that means is that we don't want a study that we got a significant result, but the study was under power and the result, we were just super lucky. Um, and the other reason why we need power is, well, reviewers will require other, uh, other way to statistical power to ensure that uh, resources are not wasted or ethically uh, reasons. But this is a trade-off and, and then we can, you know, power depends on many things. And, um, and of course, you know, we need, we need to have a clear uh, idea of what difference we want to detect before we start uh, thinking about what is the sample size we need. Why is that? Look at those two curves, right? So um, if we change the variance and the mean difference, right, or the effect size, uh, power will change. So given a fixed sample size n, right, and the sample size and the variance, so think about the variance as, you know, curves that are flatter, they have, you know, they're more spread out, those have higher variability than curves that are kind of like very narrow and tall, right? That is kind of like the, the sort of a, an idea of how big or small is the variance is the, how those curves are, you know, very tall or, 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 or flat. And then the effect size or the difference is the difference between the means mu zero and mu one, the null and the alternative, right? What difference, you know, we can put the curves one here and the other one on the wall, right? That is a very large effect size. Or, you know, if we bring them closer together, right, it's, here, it's a smaller effect size. So we have large, larger, given that we have a fixed sample size, larger variance, you know, we make this curve flatter, right? The, the white area on, on your right is, is going to be smaller, right? We have lower power. And also, if we bring the curves together, closer together, the white area, 
reduces, so we have lower power as well. Given a variance and effect size is fixed, right, how can we increase power? Well, if we increase sample size, right? We make, even the given the sorry, we make this very, very tall, we increase sample size, we increase power. But we can also change power by manipulating the trade-off between type one and type two errors, right? If you move the yellow area over here, what are we doing with power? We get larger power, right? If we move yellow over there or, or beta over there, we have much lower power. So this is, these are all things that can um, help us get in better power, or at least uh, we can manipulate power by manipulating the things. So what I can tell you, what, what is it the sample size and power determined by? Typically, and what everybody uh, tells uh, when they're, or, or th start thinking, when they start thinking about experiments, and power is, well, how, mon how much money do I have? Right? So that is the formula for power, the budget available to the budget per sample, and that will give me the sample size. But in reality is that uh, if we don't have much money and we can only afford few samples, we are wasting. It's a complete waste, right? It's better than run an experiment, go on vacation, do something else with the money, because running a, you know experiment that has not a proper sample size is just total waste. But if we have a lot of money and we have too many and we get too many samples or subjects or animals, it could be a partial waste. We are doing much more than what actually should be doing. So we need to actually power studies properly and think hard about scientific questions and what is the relevant difference that we want to detect. Um, the, other, the other thing that you need to keep in mind is that observed power, which is after you run the experiment, after you got the results, looking at what was the power of that study, that's not, there's not information to the analysis. Your, your, the power is a probability of getting a significant result. Once you did the experiment and you got a significant result, the probability doesn't matter, right? So the observed power has no information to the analysis. Retrospective effect size determination saying, oh, this random experiment, I found this difference. Oh, this is the difference I wanted to detect. Um, that shifts complete attention to what is uh, relevant or important from the scientific point of view. A significant p-value does not mean biological or clinical meaningfulness. So we learned that power um, depends on the design of the experiment. The test is statistic, we didn't talk about this, but you know, whether it's a t-test or it's a, you know, survival, uh, endpoint is, is completely different. Power depends on the sample size, the true mean difference or effect size that we want to detect. The population variances, remember the shape of those curves that were either flat or tall, and type one error or a type, um, the probability of rejecting a null when uh, is, is true, the null is true. So what are the things that we need to determine the sample size? We need to know the structure of the experiment. Is this gonna be a you know, two-group experiment? Is it gonna be four? Is it gonna be how we're gonna, what is the structure or design of the experiment? What is the outcome measure and method of the analysis? We need to <laughs> have a type one error chosen. Usually it's 5%, but for uh, sequencing or, or High dimensional uh, the, uh, data experiments, we recommend, recommend 0.1%. For those, uh, the desired power is usually 80%, but for sequencing analysis, we try to go to 95%. The variability of the outcome measure is also important to determine the sample size. And sometimes we recommend performing a pilot study or using data in the literature to know about the variability on the outcome measure. And we need to know what is the smallest meaningful 
relevant biological clinical effect. That is something that we need to know before we start uh, even thinking of doing an experiment. How can we reduce the, sam the sample size? Well, um, if we reduce the number of groups being compared, remember, you know, the mega experiments, the multifactorial experiments, and we are uh, comparing multiple groups, we're going to need a larger sample size. So if we get more focus and we are going to compare A and B only, that will reduce, us, uh, reduce sample size. So narrow down or, or reconsider the, the scope of the study, that will help us reduce sample size. Find more precise outcomes. Sometimes, you know, the endpoint that we want to measure is, is complicated, is too variable. We, we can think of a surrogate measure uh, rather than, for example, proportion of animals that die in a group. You know, for comparing proportions, we need larger sample sizes. Um, Decrease the variability in the measurements. How can we do that, right? Make groups or subjects more homogeneous. Use stratification or control for other variables such as batch effect or, or age. The, 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 of course, there is a trade-off, right? When we make things more focused and more homogeneous, what we lose is the ability of generalizability, right? We're going to need to think of, well, if we are reducing the scope of the experiment, then what is our target population, right? Then we are, as we get focused, the, the trade-off is that we cannot make uh, conclusions that are as general as maybe we intended. Multiple testing 101. We need to adjust for alpha when we do more than one test, and you have heard this, I hope. But, uh, but we are still kind of hesitant. Why do we need to adjust our, uh, uh, our comparisons? So why do we need to adjust for alpha? So you need to think about that when you want to test null hypotheses that are several null hypotheses, say from one to M, right? Uh, each at an alpha level, then the probability of making at least one error uh, can be much larger than actually alpha for the whole experiment, right? When we are testing multiple things all at alpha level, the overall uh, alpha, a, a type of one error for the experiment is larger than alpha. So if we conduct, for example, 10 independent tests and alpha, at alpha 0.05, then the probability of at least one p-value will be uh, less than alpha is 0.4. It's so almost 50%, 40% chances of getting one significant uh, p-value by chance. And this is easy, right? W at least one is one minus the probability of no type one error that give me 40%. To fix this problem, we uh, need to do some adjustment, right, of the alpha level. And so this is a huge problem in genomic data analysis. And so just you believe what uh, I just said, right? Um, if this here is a distribution of random 10,000 genes, random, right? And this is a distribution of p-values, right? You know, free value from 0 to 1. If you want to put a line on to 0.05, how many genes? These are random genes you get 5% that are, have a p-value less, less than 0.05. So we need, this is a huge problem, and, and multiple adjustment is a huge problem in this type of analysis. The most basic uh, adjustment, and very conservative, is a Bonferroni adjustment. Instead of... Uh, but one for that, that this method says is that instead of adjusting, of using each hypothesis at alpha level 0.05, we say, okay, we have 10,000 genes. I'm going to use an alpha of 0.05 divided by 10,000. That is a very small, very conservative p-value, right? It's, it can be proven that by using uh, this inequality, right, if, if we do this, the overall uh, 
the probability of at least one false reject, rejection is bounded by alpha. So yes, we are going to control type 1 error, but it has a huge cost, uh, which we lose power or the alpha at each uh, gene level is very, very small. For example, and this is an example, right, if we have eight genes and, or eight tests and alpha 0.05, we test each hypothesis or each gene at, at alpha 0.05 divided by H, which is a 0 0.006. But this is not practical when we have 10,000 genes. So think about, again, the two-way table and multiple testing, right? Uh, and we have our decision of not reject, reject the hypothesis, which is the true or false. And let's assign letters or, uh, to the two-way table and then think of what are the things that we know and what are the things that we don't know. So little m, right, is the total number of tests, right? And that is known. You know how many tests you're going to run. The number of true nulls, m0, and false nulls, m1, are fixed, but you don't know them. Right? Those depend on what is a reality, but you don't know any of those quantities. The number of rejected hypotheses, R, right, is random and observable. You know how many of those genes are going to be rejected, or uh, hypotheses are going to be rejected. The number of false rejected nulls, which is V, is random, but not observable. Right? What Bonferroni does is controls for what we call the family-wise error rate, which is the probability of uh, at least one false rejection, right? Uh, so it's a probability control for the probability of making one or more type one errors. That is way too conservative, we said. What type of control do we want to use? For genomics data, it's probably more appropriate to control the probability of type 1 error among all rejected hypotheses. We perform thousands of tests, and these uh, experiments are explorative in nature, right? So then we, you know, think and say, well, we can be a little bit more lenient and not be such a restriction, restricted control. The problem with the Monferroni is that it has low power, right? When we as Shasta, we reduce alpha, very tiny alpha, we, knew, we saw that power gets reduced. But of course, we need some type of control. What shall we do? There is this concept of the false discovery rate that uh, it was this, uh, defined by Benjamin Ian Hartberg in 1995. And it's basically the, the expected value or the, the weighted average of the, all the false discoveries, is, false discoveries among all uh, rejected hypotheses. And we want to keep that small. So that is the definition of false discovery rate. So we need to know how or need a method of how to control this quantity instead for genomic analysis, right? And these are the steps, the basic steps of the Benjamin, Benjamin E. Hochberg algorithm. But basically, you fix a, set, a value of alpha between 0 and 1. You order the p-values observed, right? And then you find the largest i such that, you know, the p-value is smaller than that uh, preset alpha, which actually that is the way it can be defined. And then you reject the corresponding null hypothesis for all those genes that are significant genes up to, to that threshold, right? Um, there are other extensions to this approach. You can, you can do, but basically the, the take home message is that Bonferroni is way too conservative for this type of genomics analysis. And we instead can control the false discovery rate, the expected value of uh, rejected nulls, the false discoveries among all rejected nulls. 
So final conclusions, experiments, experiments should be designed. I think that I, I repeated this uh, uh, long enough that, that I convinced you. Good designs and, uh, and appropriate analysis can lead to reduced sample size and interpretable results. Good designs and analysis <laughs> and analysis will lead to reproducible results. And of course, you know, it will be good to consult or talk to uh, experts in both analysis and design and, and, power and sample size certification for your experiments. And this is all I have. Joe will show you now why uh, hands-on type of uh, experiment uh, activities to show some of these concepts. Do you have any questions? Yes. Yeah. How is that <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's, it's right. What is the 20 coming from? What is the 20 uh, number coming, coming from, right? How was that? What is the certification for that sample size? How, do you ter deter how was that determined? Hopefully, ideally, was because you had information on the variability of the outcome measure that you want to, to, to measure on the, on the endpoint. You have information on the difference that what is biologically relevant and meaningful in that endpoint, right? What difference you want to detect? A 20% increase, 30% increase for reduction. You know, the things, but they have to be uh, justified with when it's clinically relevant, which is typically hard in biological uh, or, or mechanistic experiments, but it has to be some, what is, what would be important for you to keep going that path in scientifically, right, that research, right? If the difference is very tiny, you probably will need to stop and think of something else. So what is relevant, right? What would be relevant? Yes, oh yes, there are formulas. When you have all those values, yes, there are formulas depending on what uh, test statistic will be used. Yes, there are formulas. There are software, right? You, we have software now that we don't need to use just, you know, uh, plug in numbers into a formula, but there are software to calculate sample sizes depending on all those things. Uh, 